And I want to introduce and welcome everybody to this session um, that's going to be presented uh, by Jillian Adji today. Um, she's joining us from the Royal College of Midwives and her campaign and her research is really interesting looking at listening really to the voices of midwives. So I'm going to go ahead and hand the presentation over to you, Jillian. And we're going to take questions as we go, but we'll answer them at the end. So feel free to, to type them in. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody, and happy International Day of the Midwives. I'm absolutely delighted to be doing this presentation for everybody. I've worked for the RCM since 2006. I am a midwife. I was a clinical midwife for nearly 25 years um, in Sheffield. That's where I practice. Um, and I supported midwives um, when I joined the Royal College of Midwives as a regional officer. And I now manage a team of regional officers across the north of England. I led on this campaign, Caring for You, for the Royal College of Midwives um, from 2016 to the end of last year. And it was a really important campaign for us. Um, we knew that our members were complaining of feeling stressed um, in the workplace, not being able to get a break, et cetera, um, or even have a drink while they were at work because of the de because of the increasing um, workload. So we did feel that we needed to raise the importance of the health and well-being of our members. Um, and I suppose it really started to hit home when we were campaigning for better pay in 2014, um, where midwives were telling us how bad they were feeling. So the campaign um, came for you, as it says there, was um, to improve RCM members' health, safety and well-being at work so that they were able to provide high quality maternity care for the women and their families. And I think we know that supportive and open workplaces benefit both staff and service users. There's, there's lots of research around um, if you feel happy and motivated, you feel well supported at work, um, then you perform much better, you're confident, uh, you're in good health, uh, and, and obviously good health, safety and well-being underpins all of that. Um, and clearly an investment in staff is an investment in the care for women and families. We know that the NHS budget is primarily um, spent on, um, on staff, so it's really important that staff are well cared for, but it's also very important that those staff are well and are at work because they are a valuable resource. Uh, and I think also it, when we look back at research into health and well-being over the years, Borman in um, 2010, I think it was, he started to look at um, health, safety and well-being of NHS staff. And actually that work hadn't really gone very far. Simon Stevens, the CEO for um, NHS England in 2016, said that he really wanted to improve staff health. So actually they are in running this campaign. The RCM were actually pushing on a door that was wide open really as far as the NHS was concerned. Um, the campaign was launched in June uh, 2016, but prior to that, for the first six months of 2016, the campaign steering group um, set about planning the campaign, making sure that we had all of our ducks lined up for the campaign launch. But the really important part of the campaign was obviously doing a benchmark about how our members were feeling. And we conducted a survey of RCM members uh, in March 2016. And we asked them a number of questions about their health, safety and well-being at work, how they were feeling, stress, undermining behaviours, whether they had access to um, occupational health um, in their own organisations, and whether they were aware of the organisational policies in their organisations that could help support their health, safety and well-being. Uh, we had four themes that we wanted to concentrate on for the campaign. Um, and we wanted to make sure that we, we tried to cover these themes over the course of the 18 months of the campaign. 
And although the campaign did come to an end um, in, uh, at, uh, in December 2017, we actually have tried to now embed Caring For You into everything that we do at the RCM and hopefully everything that our, our members and our activists are doing in workplaces across the UK um, around looking after um, looking after each other, looking after our, um, the colleagues that we work alongside and, and clearly um, making sure that um, we look after the women that we're caring for. So the themes were around uh, maternity working conditions because we knew that staffing levels weren't, weren't good. Shift lengths, we knew that our members weren't necessarily being offered a variety of shift patterns to work, work along. And, um, and obviously a big thing was around taking breaks. We, we've known for a number of years that there's a, an issue with undermining behaviours in the NHS and certainly maternity services. Um, we have, um, we've, al we've always been unfortunately in maternity services and obstetrics at the top of the list for undermining behaviours in um, NHS staff surveys. Uh, the RCM had previously done and continues to work with the um, RCOG on undermining behaviours and um, we had um, previously um, done work and produced a toolkit for undermining behaviours for both obstetricians and midwives to work together to improve the culture in their workplace. We also knew that um, we were looking at different ways of working for our members and continuity of carer, which is, is clearly now post better birth, is, uh, is definitely something that organisations are trying to um, look at models of continuity of carer now. So that we wanted positive working styles to be a win-win scenario so that we could get some flexibility for our members and that actually those positive working relationships um, would start to um, underpin everything that we do. We also, um, because we represent a lot of our members following um, serious incidents, so we knew that um, resilience and coping and post-traumatic stress was definitely a problem for some of our members. And we did have a lot of discussions around um, whether we wanted, how we wanted to make our members more resilient. And we didn't want to make them more resilient just so that they could work harder and they could endure more stress. But actually we've got a very stressful job and it's very difficult at times to, um, to handle difficult situations. So we wanted to, we, we do feel that our members need to be supported when, those, when, when they're going through some very difficult times. And that was the resilience that we were we were looking at and I'll come on to a little bit more about that later on. Um, as I said that we, we know that supportive and open workplaces benefit both staff and users and investment in staff um, is an investment for the women that we care for. So we launched our campaign and we had the survey results um, ready and that's a document that you can download from the RCM website and certainly some of the things that I'm talking about this afternoon um, is, um, is in the survey results for you and there's also um, a number of quotes from our members um, from 2016 about how they were feeling at work um, which um, is really interesting to read um, and really quite sad as well in some cases because of how our members were feeling. Um, so we really, really wanted to make um, make some inroads in improving um, how they were feeling over the course of this campaign. So the second publication, which um, went along with the launch in 2016 was how are we gonna do it then? So as part of the plan, we needed to think about, we've done this survey, so actually how now are we gonna go about um, supporting our members in the workplace and the idea was that we want obviously health safety and well-being should be key to everything that we're doing and that clearly our our members should all want to be involved in it so as a trade union as well as a, um, a professional organization um, we organize in our workplaces so we organized 
to um, engage with our members to see what they want and see what we can do for them. We organize, in, we organize them so that we can recruit more members and we organize so we can recruit more activists in organizations because the RCM is the strength of its members and that's what's really important. So it's a two-way communication between our members and, um, and the RCM. Um, so this publication supported the campaign and how um, our health and safety reps and our stewards could work with the heads of midwifery um, in partnership on the um, charter commitments. So what we were asking organisations to do was to sign up to this campaign charter. And we wanted to make the charter as broad as we possibly could so things were going to be achievable. And we asked our stewards and our heads of midwifery, as I said, to work in partnership to sign up to this charter. And the first thing that they needed to do was they needed to develop and implement an action plan. So throughout the course of the campaign, our reps and our heads of midwifery were sending us um, their action plans to look at so so that they were telling us the sort of things that they were looking at whether it was something as simple as ensuring that our members got a break which seemed to be the smallest thing that made a massive difference to our to our members as i was going around the country um, during the campaign and um, we wanted to make sure that midwives and maternity support workers had access to a variety of ship shift patterns so that they had um, the, the ability to work flexibly um, and we obviously wanted to promote positive working cultures and a working environment and that is included in taking breaks. Um, just working on the um, what we'd already done with the RCOG, we had a statement of commitment calling for zero tolerance um, for undermining behaviours. So we wanted to make sure that this was part of the campaign charter. So as organisations signed up for Caring for You, they were also signing up for the zero tolerance um, to bullying, be bullying behaviours. And we, as I said, that many of our, our members couldn't access occupational health or they didn't they weren't aware of organizational policies for their mental health and physical health safety and well-being so as part of the campaign we hope that action plans would look at how um, those policies um, and working with occupational health that members would have greater access to support in the workplace and clearly nurturing a compassionate and supportive workplace that cares for the midwives and msws and students and obstetricians and anybody else that's working alongside midwives is really important so that they can obviously best care for the women and families that they are looking after. So this is what our members were telling us. They were tired, they felt unwell, they were dehydrated because they, they were doing 12 hour shifts and they weren't having a drink. They felt like they wanted to cry because of the, the pressures of work. And some of them were telling us that they didn't even have a chance to go to the toilet. So some of the results, um, and these are just a few of them. So if you wanted to look at um, more results from the survey, that, that, that is in the, um, the publication um, that is on our website. So 50% of our members were worried about making a mistake at work because they felt so tired. And that was clearly really worrying for us and and we had some really strong comments from members about how tired they felt um and 71 percent of our members were telling us that they they'd come to work in the last three months despite feeling um not well enough to perform their duties and some of the quotes in our that we got back from members around this was that clearly they didn't want to let their colleagues down uh, and they didn't want to let um, the women down that they were caring for. But they were also worried about punitive sickness absence policies. And they also felt, unfortunately, from some of their colleagues that they would be criticised for being off work um, ill. And again, this just showed us or highlighted that the lack of empathy towards our colleagues um, that we were working with. And I think some of that is just um, because 
Maternity services were so intense. We knew that we were three and a half thousand midwives short just in England alone of midwives to be able to deliver this, a safe service. So actually the pressure that midwives and maternity support workers were under and still are under is absolutely um, immense. Um, and I think members tend to um, just come to work, look after the patients that they need to look after, and they tune out to everything else that maybe is going on around them with their colleagues, because actually that's the only way that they could cope and get through a shift. And when they went home, they had caring responsibilities. Um, they, they just sort of zoned out when they were at work. But actually what we did know is that they weren't doing a bad job so that, that women still felt that they were being cared for by the midwives. It was just all the pressure was being taken um, by, the, by the midwives themselves. Um, clearly, it says 84% of our midwives said that they had a, an increased um, workload in the last six months. So this is 15 to 16, because remember this, these survey results are from March 2016. We know, as I said, there was a shortage of um, midwives, and there still is, um, which is an issue that we are trying to address. Um, and 22% of our members, um, the only 22% only of our members felt that they had time to build a rapport with service users. Now, this obviously is something that's really quite worrying. Um, time to do their job, trying to build up those relationships with women that is really, really important. Um, but we also know from women, because we've done a previous survey um, with women around um, how they felt um, about the time that they spent with midwives. And actually women were telling us that they could sense that midwives were short of time and they could sense that they probably didn't have enough time to discuss all their issues with them. So if they were going to a, an antenatal clinic to see their midwife, and they may have had, I don't know, half a dozen or 10 questions that they wanted to ask them because they knew the midwife was under pressure and um, they only had a 10 or 15 minute appointment. They had to think, they told us that they had to think of the top three questions that they really wanted their midwife to ask. So obviously our members and women were saying the same thing is that we haven't got enough time to to build up that rapport and actually women were saying we don't feel we're getting enough time with our our midwives either okay so 48 percent of our members were saying that they felt stressed every day at work or most days. And the most common reason for this, which I've already talked about, was the workload, staff shortages, and that feeling of not enough time to do their job. And then looking at the, um, the dilemma around breaks, 62% of our members said that they felt dehydrated at work. And actually there is evidence now to show that cognitive function actually decreases when we're dehydrated. So if, you know, I, I know midwives that seem to wear it as a badge of honour that oh, I've done a 12 hour shift and I've, I've, had, I've had one drink and it, as if oh, I've managed a 12 hour shift and not gone to the toilet. It, it, was, it was a bit like um, I remember thinking when I was a, um, a nurse and working on um, a care of the elderly wall thinking gosh my back really aches today. I've worked hard when completely that was the wrong thing to be thinking. Um, so what our members were telling us out there in the field when we were out and about, they weren't getting their breaks, they weren't even having a drink. Actually, this survey um, absolutely um, told us, I suppose, what we already knew. And it's not, I'm sure it's not just um, in the UK, this problem. And I can see some questions. Um, Letitia is saying that uh, this is a universal problem for us all. Um, and yeah, you are legally entitled to a break. And I think it's about, you need to make sure you're getting a break. And I think it's when we, when I went around the country and we were talking about breaks, and as I said before, the smallest thing, having a drink, 
has made the biggest impact. So actually, if this campaign has done anything and it's about asking your colleagues if they have had a break, looking out for each other, asking your colleagues, can I get you a drink? Can I bring you a cup of tea in? Can I bring you a coffee in? That's really, really important because we need to look after each other as well as managers looking after us. We also need to look after each other. I think the other thing is, is that I went to a service um, in the Midlands uh, a few weeks ago and it was really, really funny because they hadn't signed the Caring for You Charter, but they were going to sign it that day and we were looking at an action plan. And the midwives in the room before the head of midwifery arrived said, we can't have a break and we're not allowed to take drinks into the room. Well, what, the head of midwifery came along and said she'd never said that. And that actually we solved the problem of having a drink um, really, really quickly because the head of midwifery in front of lots of midwives says uh, you can have a drink. Obviously, you need to risk assess that if you're taking a hot drink into a room where there might be little children. Um, but yeah, absolutely. You must have a drink. So I think it's really important that we look after each other. And it's not just the manager's responsibility to do that. Yes, they have got a responsibility to do it. But actually, we need to be asking for it and saying we need um, a drink. So I suppose if you're dehydrated, you're also um, delaying using the toilet. And some criticism I had about um, this um, statistic was really quite interesting from a head of midwifery who said, hmm, if they can't, if midwives can't um, get themselves to the toilet, how on earth can they advocate for a, um, a woman if they can't get themselves to the toilet? Well, actually, being a clinical midwife and being a, uh, a labour ward coordinator for a number of years, you would set off to go to the toilet, but you just need to stop and talk to somebody that needed you quite quickly or you'd need to go into a room you know it's sometimes it's easier said than done and I can absolutely see where you delayed going to the loo because work didn't allow it um, and the other figure on this slide is around the number of hours that um, our members were telling us that they worked unpaid in 2014 when we were doing the pay campaign we asked the same question and our members were saying that they uh, worked three hours unpaid. So a year and a bit later, they were telling us it was five hours unpaid a week. So if you add that up, that's a lot of time the NHS is getting out of midwives and maternity support workers. Uh, I think we also believe that this is an um, underestimated figure um, of five hours. So actually, um, I'm just going to have a look at the next slide and see what we've got. Oh, let me just go back a bit. So what did we do when we got these survey results is that um, we launched the campaign. We wanted organisations to sign up for Caring For You. We publicised when those organisations signed up. So we used social media. We asked people to take photographs of them signing the charter, of any events that they did when they when they signed the charter. Quite a lot of them had tea parties or pampering sessions for their midwives and support workers and students. So our success over the la over that 18 months of the campaign is that about 134 organisations signed up during that 18 month period. And that's out of a total of uh, 164. So that was about 81% of organisations across the UK. Um, four more organisations have signed up since uh, we actually officially closed the campaign but we're still um we're still allowing organizations to sign the charter obviously because it's really we know how important it is so health and safety reps have worked in partnership with homs um to develop action plans um and they're working through those action plans um as we speak today what I would say is that clearly for the organisation that signed the charter first, which was um, Central Manchester, and I think they may be on the next slide. Central Manchester signed our charter first, and this is um, our health and safety ref, <coughs> excuse me, and the head of midwifery on the 6th of June um, 2017. Now, Central Manchester already were doing some work around um, their staff's health, safety and well-being. So actually, they're really they're two years on with their 
um, action plans um, having signed their charter. Some organisations have only just signed, so they're not as far on with their action plans. So that I think when we resurveyed our members at the end of last year, obviously, there was a mixture of responses and some were further on than others and some organisations hadn't actually um, signed the campaign charter. So this is the work that Central Manchester were doing and they were they were working not only with midwives but they were also working across uh, gynaecology and uh, neonatology as well. And actually Central Manchester have resurveyed their staff um, uh, last year and also resurvey and also surveyed the women that our staff are caring for and that actually that survey showed that um, women uh, felt well cared for that they felt that the atmosphere and the environment that they were being cared for was a happy um, it, happy place to come into they felt that it, that it felt like a supportive environment the, the number of complaints received from women had gone down, sickness absence for our members had improved um, in, in central Manchester. So I think the work that they're doing has absolutely supported our members there. And I've used central Manchester because they were the first, but there are a number of organisations and best practice that we've got um, at, at, in, the, in, the, um, in the RCM where, where organisations are really um working hard um to improve staff health safety and well-being this was um this is in um, northampton and this is a trust in the east midlands that again they've signed our charter but actually as an organization they were already committed to health safety and well-being so as i said at the beginning of the presentation we were pushing on the on an open door as far as this campaign was concerned to a, to a certain extent because organisations were buying into it really really easily. During the campaign, we obviously needed to think of things that um, would keep the momentum going um, for the um, for the campaign, so to keep the interest up. Um, so we thought of a number of initiatives. One of them was a predominant predominant Dot, can't even say it, Pedometer Challenge, which we actually did in April last year, which was the fortnight before IDM last year. So the, if the challenge ended just in IDM week. So when the challenge ended, we also encouraged our members at that point to have a celebration for IDM. So we had a really brilliant IDM celebration last year uh, on the back of um, the activities that we were doing for caring for you and you can see from this slide our members um, walked ever so many steps and the winning team was from Airedale and they walked nearly 1.5 million steps and I know that um, talking to the teams that were walking it was absolutely huge the nearly one in the numbers of teams that took part and what they were getting out of it and they were taking their kids for walks afterwards. It wasn't just about how many steps we walk at work, um, which clearly midwives and support workers walk many, many steps at work. This was about looking after yourself and being well and doing something outside of work. Yes, we were counting the steps while we were at work, but it was really important to actually, as a team, count those steps outside of work and be more active. Um, also, um, the campaign gave the RCM the ability to organise workplaces. As I said before, we're a professional association and a trade union, and trade unions organise their members. And that obviously, this campaign encouraged um, workplaces to get organised. It encouraged our members to work together. It encouraged us to engage with our members and hear what they were saying. We could recruit new members and we could recruit new activists. We could, it helps retain our members because they think that we're doing something positive to support them. And clearly, health, safety and well-being is something that everybody can sign up to because it's very close to our hearts. As I said, that um, the, 
the uh, pedometer challenge led very nicely into IDM 2017. And with that came our Caring for You Tea Party. So we produced Caring for You Bunting for IDM. We encouraged our workplaces to look after each other and uh, have tea parties to celebrate IDM and Caring for You. We also used IDM last year to encourage some activity in workplaces around IDM but also use that activity as a springboard to sign the Caring For You Charter. So IDM and Caring For You last year went very much hand in hand. And actually this year, um, over the past two weeks, RCM staff have been out and about across the UK celebrating IDM with our members um, again this year. And many of them have continued the same sort of theme around caring for you and looking after each other, sitting down, having a cup of tea and talking about midwifery and midwifery issues and International Day of the Midwives. So I think it's been a really, really positive IDM for us in um, the UK this year. And I know we couldn't cram in um, all the IDM events we wanted in the last fortnight. So I know that we've got some spilling into next week and the week after as well. So that's really, really great news for IDM. So the other thing that we did is that we encouraged organisations to send us their best practice submissions. And we had some, we didn't have as many as we wanted. So some of these things on this screen was some of the things that they did. So for example, one organisation in the southwest of England decided we needed some emergency toiletries for when um, staff have had a busy shift and they want to freshen up from work at work. We need some emergency supplies some healthy snacks for um, our staff if they've not been able to get a break on really busy shifts. Because I think we can all understand that although yes, we should be getting our breaks, that sometimes it's those shifts that are just the shifts that are that maybe nobody will, will get a break. So actually um, the RCM branch made sure that there was healthy snacks, fruit and drinks for members to have um, when they couldn't get to the canteen. Um, uh, and we also, lots of organisations came up with celebrating midwifery and, um, and their colleagues. So they would have employer of the month or, and that would be for everybody. Some people had really silly challenges to sort of in, improve morale. Um, it's the midwife that talks the most, that happens to be me today at the moment. Um, and just to get people involved in talking and to, um, just got that sense of we're all in it together and we're working together. Um, and actually, um, what a couple of the best practices I can share with you, I think I've got time, is um, Cardiff um, wanted a, uh, some robust, really robust methods to engage with staff and to get feedback from their 300 midwives that they've got working in, um, in Cardiff. So the RCM reps and human resources would do walk around the unit. So therefore, so they were seen working in partnership and that they would be dealing with concerns of the midwives as they were walking around the unit and be able to talk to them together to, to deal with their concerns and certainly um, at the same time promoting staff well-being. Cardiff found that morale had increased over the course of the campaign and um, they held days on resilience, they held days around, they had appreciation boxes so people could put in, um, uh, I suppose it's like a, a suggestion box idea so that somebody, if they appreciated some, somebody, something somebody did, that they could actually put in a little box that they they were thanking that person. Lots of people had shout out boards where they could say, uh, Jill, Jill Adji was really fantastic today. She really helped me when I was having a difficult time, those sort of things, um, so that they could have shout out for, for staff, which, which was really, really very positive. Um, Cardiff started small, they had a staff Facebook page um, and although they thought they were starting quite small, they actually 250 people um, signed up really, really quickly. They have coffee and um, cake and catch up 
session. So again, working on this theme that midwives have got to have cake, which of course we have, um, but actually using those opportunities to chat and discuss uh, their problems and issues. And sometimes that wouldn't necessarily just be work issues. That would be personal issues. I think I found with 12 hour shifts that actually you come in, you do your job, you go home, you don't actually know what's happening in anybody's lives. Um, so really um, our members really appreciated this. They also in Cardiff supported newly qualified midwives and uh, maternity support workers. And um, just recently, they've had a 10 week yoga for beginners for all their maternity staff, um, which has been supported by the trust, which has really, really increased staff morale. And there's quite a few examples of best practice where midwives who maybe did hypnotherapy or massage for women were then given time, protected time by their heads of midwifery, so paid time within their working week to run um, sessions for their colleagues. So that that's proved really, really um, good. I think that was Bristol actually that, that did that. Um, County Durham and Darlington set off with a running club um, and they started off doing a 5K challenge and then they thought, crikey, we can do this. And now they're running half marathons. Um, but again, it's about teamwork and working together and actually doing something that's not work, but actually something that you can do as a team together, which increases your morale and how you work more positively um, when you are at work. Um, and one of the other examples we had was from, uh, let me think, George Elliott. Um, and they, they did have an issue around staff getting their breaks and they also had no access to hot food. So they surveyed their members and they, uh, they went to senior managers and they made sure that staff were relieved for their breaks um, and they set up a buddying system for breaks. They also made sure that the uh, little hospital calf that was there for patients as well, but they, they, they were able to extend that and put in more tables and chairs so staff could also get a break there as well. And this hospital as well, they had a seating area outside, uh, which is a bit of a, not a particularly nice garden area, but they managed to get some funding to clear the garden, put tables and chairs outside. So on nice days, so I'm keeping my fingers crossed today um, in George, at George Elliott Trust that there are midwives having their break as we speak in the sunshine um, in the East Midlands. OK, so we also did a little bit of research during the campaign. Well, this wasn't a piece of RCM research, but it was some research that um, Louise Silverton from the RCM advised uh, the Poppy programme and Professor Helen Spivey from Nottingham University and uh, who's a midwife and Professor uh, Pauline Slade who is a psychologist uh, in at Liverpool University had um, been studying post-traumatic stress um, in midwives for a number of years and they had come up with some interventions uh, to support midwives. Um, Liverpool Women's Hospital um, signed up to working with Helen and Pauline and we're still waiting for um, Helen Pauline's report to be published actually I've got on here it's, it's the end of 17 but it's, um, it's not been published yet um, but what we do know from Liverpool is that what they try to do is they try to look at interventions that would support midwives if they were they'd gone through a traumatic experience so a, a, a poor outcome that they weren't expecting so there were three steps to this one self-help which is just information leaflets um, peer support system and then psychological intervention if that was necessary <coughs> The uptake from midwives at Liverpool was high. Um, uh, Trauma-focused clinical psychology was actually well received, um, but certainly they felt that more work was needed with the peer support to increase 
the workshop numbers of the midwives that were going through the workshop so that they could act so that and more midwives could access that midwives did report um increased job um satisfaction um during the period and i know from speaking to helen spivey that sickness absence rates um were reduced uh, and i believe quite significantly um and midwives who had previously reported they wanted to leave the um the profession were were uh, there were few by the end of the work that they'd done in Liverpool. There were fewer midwives reporting that they wanted to leave um, the the profession. Now I know Helen and Pauline really want to um, look at this in a much wider scale because sort of working with one unit, um, with, with, although they've had really good results, they would like to work, work across a, uh, a a bigger area. Um, which would um, involve a number of maternity services. So at the moment, I know that they're looking for funding and submitting funding bids for that. So I really do hope that they get some funding because I think it's a really interesting piece of research. And again, with the RCM representing members, I know of a number of members that we're representing at the moment through internal mechanisms, through internal investigations and NMC investigations, how traumatic they are for our members. So any support that we can give our members to, um, to be able to, um, to go through these sort of investigations um, would be really, really good. And, and I suppose this sort of this really was the bit that sort of linked into the resilience and coping mechanism part of the theme for the, um, the campaign. So the other bit of research that we actually commissioned um, in 2017 was um, the work and uh, health and emotional well-being of midwives, the WELM study. Um, and this was commissioned by us. And um, I'm sure maybe some of you may be aware of it. It's work that's also been undertaken in Australia, uh, New Zealand, Sweden and Finland. I believe it's maybe or has been also undertaken in Canada and there's also proposals for it to be undertaken in Germany and Ireland. This obviously allows for international comparisons to be made despite the variations in national health systems and models of midwifery development. Um, the study was carried out by um, Billy Hunter at the University of Cardiff in collaboration with the Griffin University. I know that's due for publication anytime soon. Nearly 2,000 of our members responded to the survey um, in May, June last year. Um, this was well above population norms and those other WELM, um, and those other WELM countries. The RCM now needs to discuss how we're going to use the information that this study has given us um, to improve staffing with a focus on retention, uh, I think increasing support for interventions and giving um, time off to staff time off to attend the support that we can give them. I think I might be running out of time. Okay, so very quickly, these are the highlights of the campaign. I've already talked about the numbers of organisations that signed, signed up. We also held a number of events during that 18 months and, and, and clearly those numbers were high. This sort of links into us being an organising trade union. We had hoped that we'd get more health and safety reps, but I think with any trade union, I think the numbers of um, representatives, whether they're stewards or whether they're health and safety reps, there is a certain amount of churn. Um, so unfortunately, we only had a net increase of 10 health and safety reps, which was disappointing, but it's work in progress. And obviously we hope that that will improve. Um, so the follow-up survey that we've just published there were some improvements, I would say, um, but maybe not as much as we would have liked. Again, think back to what I said earlier around organisations being at different parts of their caring for you journey as far as their action plans are concerned. So, but obviously, we surveyed all members. Um, we asked, we you know, we surveyed all members, um, but there were some improvements. 
You've also got to look at it and the backdrop of the NHS as it is at the moment. It's not got any better. Our members still felt underpaid, undervalued, so morale was still low. Uh, and clearly we were three and a half midwives short. These are some of the things that our members were telling us. So again, some good things and some not so good things. Um, not massive dramatic changes, um, but I said you need to consider this in the backdrop of what the NHS is like at the moment. This is some of the good things around, certainly there's some good things here about taking a break. Um, but then from a, not a very positive comment from a midwife in England below. Um, but I think what it has done is it does raise awareness about how we look after each other and how we should be should be looking at each other. OK, so again, not so brilliant results around the sickness absence um, and improvement. So still work in progress for us there. Again, this is a little bit around what our members told us in November 17. And this is what we're going to be carrying on doing in 2018. So we're still signing up those organisations. It can't be the only step. You've got to work on your action plans. We will continue to showcase good practice. And we work with other trade unions and royal colleges because I know there's a lot of trade unions and royal colleges that are absolutely talking about the same things at the moment. So again, that door is wide open for us to work with. So, ooh. Might have just skipped. OK, so what we're doing. So we've we've clearly the Secretary of State for Health has announced recently that there's going to be 3000 more midwives, uh, student midwives coming into training. That is not without its challenges, clearly, um, for our HEI colleagues, uh, capacity in the workplace, etc. We're looking at how we um, support our maternity support workers. We will continue to raise um, concerns around health, safety and well-being. We want to strengthen midwifery leadership and we will be making announcements at um, our annual conference in October around what we're going to do about leadership. We really want to support multi-professional working. We know that people who train together work better together, there's better communications. And we're definitely promoting safe maternity care for women and babies. And I just want to say this is midwives in Liverpool, which is my hometown, if anybody hadn't clocked the accent that I've got um, is um, together we can make a difference but we have got to work together to do that thank you very much I'm not sure whether we've got any time for any questions thank you so much Jill that was a um, very inspiring presentation it's amazing the work that RCM has done um, just in the last year um, and unfortunately, we don't have time for questions. Uh, 